Good afternoon. My name is Kyle Roberts, and I'm the Associate Director of Library and Museum Programming at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to the final day of the APS virtual conference, Responsibilities, Reciprocity, and Relationships, Indigenous Studies in the Archive and Beyond. I'm glad that so many of you have been able to join us today. The American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who have offered their guidance, their expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. This week's conference is inspired by the important work of the APS's Center for Native American and Indigenous Research and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded Native American Scholars Initiative Program. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who've made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over $1 million in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Please check out our website, amphilsoc.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. We're using Zoom webinar today, so not to worry, you've all been muted. You're not gonna accidentally interrupt the conference. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. You might wanna take a second now and just locate it. it, should be right down there. You can type out your question at any point in the panel today. So when it pops in your mind, type it out. Uh, we're gonna leave about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation today for your questions of our speakers. We're also excited to offer closed captioning for this conference. If you'd like to use the closed captioning, uh, look for the CC box also on that bottom navigation bar, should be right to the right of the Q&A button. Click on that uh, and you'll see a full transcription of our speakers. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Carpenter, Curator of Native American Materials, who will be moderating Panel 7, Digital Knowledge Sharing Fellows Flash Talks. Brian is now going to explain to you the background on the Digital Knowledge Sharing Program. It's a program we call DKS for short, and introduce our speakers. He will then be joined at the end by Dr. Adriana Link, Head of Scholarly Programs, for a conversation with the presenters. So I'm going to turn myself off and turn Brian on. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you everyone for join us, joining us today. Um, I would like to let you know a little bit about what the Digital Knowledge Sharing Fellowship Program is. It is uh, part of the Native American Scholars Initiative, which brings us together this week, funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. This fellowship program supports campus and community-based scholars working on digital projects that connect archives and indigenous communities. This fellowship emerged in part from reflecting upon the many kinds of projects that we have witnessed and assisted with over the last decade at the APS's Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. We have seen many collaborative projects as well as entirely community-led projects that have needed funding for travel and other expenses to identify and obtain materials for digitization at the APS and or at other archives as well. Beyond the basic needs for access and research time, many such projects that we have encountered also have had broader goals, such as the development of new digital resources from these materials. And when they are, are at the point of conducting archival research, many projects may be in different stages of the development of those digital resources that they envision. The DKS Fellowship is designed to fulfill these particular needs. Since 2017, it has funded community-based and community-directed projects from throughout this, this continent, from Alaska to Mexico, Quebec to California and many places in between. These projects have included language reclamation initiatives, oral history recordings with community elders, territorial and treaty research, 
the development of audio transcription tools and the establishment and growth of community-based archives and cultural centers. The fellowship also includes funding for fellows to visit the APS for the annual digital knowledge sharing workshop, which is held each summer with other DKS fellows and resident APS scholars and archivists. Unfortunately, we had to postpone uh, this year's uh, DKS uh, workshop, but we hope to be able to do that again uh, next summer. I would now like to introduce uh, our, our presenters today. There will be six projects being presented about. Um, the first is uh, from Patrick Burt. Patrick is an, an, an enrolled member of the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California and a direct descendant of the Thule River Tribe. Currently, he is a do third year doctoral student at the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies at Arizona State University. Next will be Brandon Graham. Brandon Graham is the Acting Treaty Research Coordinator for the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, located in southwestern Ontario, Canada. He is enthusiastic about the potential for digital knowledge sharing and opening new dialogues between people and institutions with shared goals and interests. The third project being presented on is a collaborative project with uh, three or four people. Uh, I'll, I'll read their bios together. First is Guillermo Ramon Celis. He is a doctoral candidate in anthropology at Indiana University in Bloomington. He has lived alongside Zapotec people since his childhood and has worked happily with them for the last 10 years. Uh, Hilary Letham, who is unable to join us today, but who is a part of this project, is a poet and PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Chicago. A recent Fulbright Hayes scholar who has worked in Oaxaca since 2018, Letham's dissertation titled History Dispossessed, Haunting, Theft, and the Making of Monumental Heritage in Oaxaca, Mexico, explores the ways indigenous Zapotec and Mixtec stakeholders form social and affective relations with heritage sites. And Marco Antonio Mendez Juarez is a graphic designer, native of San Pablo Villa de Mitla in Oaxaco, Oaxaca, and co-founder of the Pitao Bezalao Cultural Center, a space created to spread and promote Zapotec culture. The following project will be from Dr. Ana Naruta Moya, who is project director of the Indigenous Digital Archive. She is also research associate professor of the University of New Mexico, a research associate of the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, and the new supervisory curator of the rich photo collections held by the New Mexico History Museum. With a growing circle of collaborators, she and her husband, Daniel Moya, who is Tewa, have been exploring ways to find and respectfully share records of the boarding schools and other records not easily available in the communities to which they relate. Our fifth project we will hear about today is from Cassandra Smith, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Art History at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her dissertation is titled Kiva Murals at Pottery Mound, a consideration of a trans-temporal performativity in a Puebloan life world. Cassandra is also the archivist for the Puebla of Isleta, Department of Cultural and Historic Preservation, and the new Yonan An Cultural Center. Finally, we'll hear from Noel Smith, of the University of California, Santa Cruz. Noel Smith is working on a historical and linguistic project in collaboration with the Nachi Nation of Oklahoma. He also currently teaches at UC Santa Cruz, Cabrillo College, and Gavilan College. So I am now glad to uh, hand it over to Pat, our first presenter, Patrick Burt.
Umhamu Heji, Patrick D. Lalagi Burt, Bigam D. Lei, Paolo Gumtanu, Shemlu Lei, Diguu Bernadine James, Ida Dila, Sharon James. Greetings to all of you from ancestral Tongva territory. Um, although I'm presenting to you from Tongva territory, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work in ancestral Akimo Autumn territory in Tempe, Arizona. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the audience and my co-presenters, as well as the American Philosophical Society for allowing me this time and space to share with you some of the work that I've done in 2018 as a digital knowledge sharing fellow. I had the opportunity to, in collaboration with the Washoe Tribe Historic Preservation Officer, to construct a Washoe Digital Archive. This archive is currently housed at the Tribal Historic Preservation Office at Washoe and is considered a living archive because of the ongoing additions to the archive, as well as the ongoing curation of items, but more importantly, because of the archive's continuous use. Um, the, this project really stemmed from community concerns that came out of the K through 12 curriculum in nearby public schools um, that had little to no mention of Washu in their historical narratives. So one thing I would like to highlight, like the theme of our conference, is the responsibility of researchers to foster and maintain reciprocal relationships with individuals or collective collaborators. My particular situation is one that is, in many ways, less and more complicated than others, less because I am an enrolled member of the Washoe tribe, but also because of the same reason. I would consider this work to be a great example of the successful navigation of individual personalities, but also a successful navigation of the complexities of tribal politics. The relationship that I've built with both the Washoe Tribal Historic Preservation Office and the items housed in the digital archive is one that I am continuously drawing from, but also contributing to. More recently, a discussion ensued between a number of cultural knowledge holders. Their concern was with access to information that's housed in the archive. This information is mostly from anthropological reports that uncovered locations of sacred sites. Their concern was really with looters. Um, some of these sites, there, there were maps included in some of the anthropological reports that I've included in the archive. So these cultural knowledge holders were concerned with looters having access to this information and uh, destroying and damaging some of those sacred sites, as well as a number of different um, interviews that were conducted by tribal members with other tribal members. This allowed for a more intimate conversation to can ensue between those two people. And some of the information that was shared between those two individuals has not been information or is information that the tribe is hesitant and reluctant to share with the wider public. Um, so through this conversation, um, it contributed to the development of a Washoe research permit. That permit is now the standard protocol for doing research in Washoe. So, back to the point that I'm hoping to make in that the healthy relationship between the Tipo and I, it's produced this component of reclamation of Washu history, but has also contributed to the advancement of Washu sovereignty as the nation is now taking control of the research in our own territories. Umwa'angui, thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Brandon Graham. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the APS for the opportunity to speak today uh, and by acknowledging the historic and continued contributions of Indigenous peoples and communities in all the places that we are joining this conference from today. 
I am not a Chippewa of the Thames band member myself, nor am I Indigenous, but I am very glad to have been invited into the Chippewa of the Thames community to conduct historical research. Um, the Chippewa of the Thames First Nation uh, Reserve land is located in uh, the Southern Great Lakes region of Canada, where the Anishinaabeg people have lived for countless generations. Um, as the community's name implies, the Chippewa of the Thames uh, Reserve is located along the Thames River in southwestern Ontario. Uh, the reserve was established through the Longwoods Treaty negotiations from 1818 to 1822. While the original reserve was over 15,000 acres, various historical circumstances have resulted in a diminishment of lands. As you can see in contrast uh, in this slide here, uh, the current reserve contains about 10,800 acres and has a membership of around 3,000 citizens with about 900 citizens on reserve. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the research we do at the Chippewa of the Thames Treaty Research Unit is intended to develop claims against the Crown government and also to provide various educational services. In doing so, we strive to create and maintain a sizable collection of literary and archival materials in both digital and uh, physical collections. So far, the community has settled three uh, major land claims uh, through Canada's specific claims process. Uh, these include the Muncie Village land claim in 1995, the Clench defalcation claim in 2005, and the Big Bear Creek claim in 2013. And these claims have provided the community with important resources and abilities. In addition to our settled claims, we have several ongoing claims in various stages of uh, the archival materials we copy and catalog also assist in consultation unit, which consults with corporate and government proponents regarding matters related to the environment, areas of cultural significance, historical and ancestral land uses, to name a few areas. Duty to consult with First Nations communities is a legal obligation in Canada and is directly related to our treaty histories. Next slide, please. Um, with the support of the Digital Knowledge Sharing Fellowship, I was able to expand my research horizons by traveling to libraries and archives across traditional Anishinaabeg territory, namely to the Newberry Library in Chicago and the uh, Burden Historical Collections in Detroit. At these institutions, I copied and uploaded relevant materials into our departmental digital archival database. Several of these materials have utilized in the community's ongoing claims, consultation software, and in our efforts. Um, included amongst these, and you can see it to the right of the screen here, is um, an 1822 pocketbook of a known origin from the Newberry Library. The pocketbook, pocketbook translates between commonly used English and Anishinaabemowin words uh, and phrases, Anishinaabemowin being the traditional language of the Anishinaabemowin. Uh, our team was excited to include this pocketbook, as well as many other culturally and historically significant materials into our digital collections. Uh, we strive to find the best ways to share these materials with the Chippewa community as well. Um, I'm grateful for the support of the DKS Fellowship and for the continued interest of the APS and for all the conference attendees, because shared interest and engage engagement really assist the research projects we conduct here at the Chippewa of the Towns First Nation. So miigwech and thank you. Um, hello, um, I'm Guillermo Ramon, um, and thank you first uh, to the American Philosophical Society for awarding us as Digital Knowledge uh, Sharing Fellows. Uh, this grant will help us to return historical and, and ethnographic knowledge to the indigenous Zapotec community of San Pablo Villa de Mitla. Um, the next one, please. Uh, this town is located 45 kilometers east of Oaxaca de Juarez in the Mexican state of Oaxaca, known mainly for its incredible examples of Zapotec architecture and the region, and it's also the region where people domesticated lands uh, thousands of years ago. The next one, please. Um, our project, Este Lugar Tiene Muchas Historias, uh, will be focused on the work of Elsie Cruz Parsons, 
Boeotian anthropologist and folklorist. Um, she conducted fieldwork in Mitla in the late 1920s and early 1930s. And between her many achievements, she was the president of the American Folk Society in between 1918 and 1920, the American Ethnological Association in 1923 and 1925. And uh, she was also the first woman elected as president of the American Anthropological Association in 1941. And the next one, please. Um, the American uh, Philosophical Society holds the archive of Elsie Close Parsons, which includes uh, the field notes that she wrote while doing her ethnography, Mitla, Town of Souls, in 1936. Um, this work remains as the definitive historical source of Mitla's vast array of customs, traditions, legends, memory, pre-Hispanic rituals, and sacred geographies. Uh, despite its indisputable significance to Oaxacan and Mexican scholarships, the text has never been translated into Spanish or Zapotec. And moreover, purchasing her monograph, which used to be cost prohibitive for most working class people in Mitla, it's impossible since it's out of print. Um, the next one, please. Este lugar tiene muchas historias is a community-based project. It draws on the Parsons archive, translating her ethnographic notes into Spanish and then Zapotec, so that Mitleños will have access to the knowledge she produced about the community. It juxtaposes Parsons' papers alongside narratives that the community has shared with us since 2008, as well as other histories the, clown, the town chooses. We will utilize a combination of ArcGIS and Google Maps, a digital open access format, so we can create visual linkages between particular places and their associated narratives. ArcGIS is an essential part of this project because it provides geographic accuracy by pinpointing the latitude and longitude of these sites. It also allows us to create and share layered maps that can emphasize different histories. And when this is combined with Google Maps, the open access mapping format facilitates community curation and stewardship. So just to show you an example of how this works, uh, this is like a map that we are uh, developing. And every time that you point in a, in a specific location, something like this will pop out. So the next one, please. Um, I don't know if you can hear it, but... Um, the previous one, please. Well, basically, yeah, uh, every time that uh, someone points a location, uh, a reference of a place uh, named by Elsie Close Parson will show up. In this case, we, uh, as we haven't worked yet in the in the works of Elsie Parsons, we choose uh, Francis Bandelier. Uh, impression of the Mitla buildings that he looked like 100 years ago and we translate that into Zapotec but also we were able to um, record this uh, translation so people can hear it read it in Zapotec Spanish and in English um, we, we can move forward if it is not working thank you um, as the most, most important goal of the project is to share this knowledge with Mitla, we are closely working with the cultural center Pitao Vizelao, where the information will be displayed for anyone interested. Uh, this place is a local collective of Mitleños, which has promoted local arts, crafts, traditions, and stories, especially with younger generations. Uh, the Zapotec idiom is one of these promoted values. By virtue of, this, of its digital approach, Este lugar tiene muchas historias, eliminates the economic barriers created by the commodification and circulation of knowledge. We are cognizant of the ways in which the knowledge Parsons collected was extracted and is the intellectual property of the community for time immemorial. Uh, this participation project decolonized history by not only returning this knowledge to indigenous Zapotec stakeholders, but by encouraging the community to place historical narratives produced by scholars on the same footing as oral traditions that may not fit within a Western epistemological framework, aiding in the dismantling of power structures. And the next one, and thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. 
Um, I'm Anna Neruda Moya with the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. Next slide, please. Uh, my husband, uh, Daniel Moya, can't join us today. He's working on COVID mitigation uh, for tribal communities in the state. Um, but he and I were, were among the first group of digital knowledge sharing uh, fellows. So I have a chance to share with you about a project that it's, that's had a few years uh, afterward uh, to develop further. The Indigenous Digital Archive is a collaborative project of the uh, State of New Mexico's Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, the New Mexico State Library, the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center that's run by all 19 Pueblo tribes, and now the New Mexico History Museum. Uh, we're fortunate to have just begun our second uh, consecutive IMLS National Leadership Grant uh, to develop the project, um, which also got some support from a Knight Foundation prototyping grant. Oh, next slide, please. I tried to advance it myself. Um, this project ex uh, originated in some listening sessions that our museum's very first native director conducted when she um, took the post. And in these sessions, uh, tribal constituents asked for more archives education and more online accessibility. And so this project is, is formulated as part of meeting those needs. Next slide, please. And in talking with a lot of um, elders, scholars, interested parties in the community, um, we decided the best home for this would be the state institutions uh, in, part, in partnership with the IPCC. Um, we created these partnerships to help spread training and create uh, stronger links in communities to the institutional resources that are available there. Next slide, please. Um, as part of our first part of the project, we assembled uh, um, semi-easily available but not easy, easily accessible records related to communities mainly in New Mexico, um, but with some extensions uh, such as Carlisle Indian School, uh, where so many of our, our, our family members and relatives went. Um, we assembled these uh, from microfilm available from the National Archives and with our support of our National Leadership Grant, we built a mechanism for being able to access, access them um, it, and allow community crowdsourcing of tagging and also allow community nomination of, of portions to redact if that, if that became necessary. We worked with our advisory panel to try to find, um, to, to be a displaying series that would um, likely all be okay to be public, but we always wanna be aware of there being the potential for something in the records and be able to act on that uh, immediately. Next, please. With our DKS uh, fellowship, we were able to make a research trip to the National Archives at, at Denver. Uh, here's my husband um, encountering for the first time in, in person the handwritten letter that his great grandfather uh, wrote to the boarding school that had his grandmother who raised him um, asking for permission for a particular plan of study for her for summer uh, for her work study. Um, we, thanks to the fellowship, we were able to make the trip for research um, on a project to uncover otherwise possibly unreported deaths at, the, at our boarding schools. Um, and we shared that research with uh, NABS, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition, that's then working with some of the schools to look at um, possibilities for commemorating otherwise unmarked uh, grave sites. Um, and we, we also, uh, due to this research, we were able to plan uh, for a, a larger digitization project for records that have never been microfilmed and are only currently available in person at, at Denver. And uh, thanks to being able to go and examine these records in person, um, we were able to successfully submit for a, a clear digitizing hidden collections um, grant. Um, we got a, a half a million dollar award for a collaborative project between us, NABs, and the Zibiwing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Life Ways. Uh, so we're really excited to embark on that. Uh, uh, some parts soon, some parts that will have to wait for travel. Next slide, please. Um, I also wanted to share with you the, um, another project that we started working on since that we're about to launch on Indigenous Peoples Day uh, in a couple of weeks here, October 12th. Um, we were um, a successful pro proposal to the National Archives Office of Innovation to help them um, connect uh, newly conserved and scanned treaties with, with, um, uh, with the communities and with members of the public. Um, 
they knew that they needed more assistance with context uh, than the, that they would be able to do just on, on catalog.gov. Um, so we developed um, a way of allowing people to explore um, by place, by tribe, uh, by time, by, by date, um, and be able to find things um, related to their community, related to their past. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so that is a project uh, with the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, National Archives, and National Archives Foundation, thanks to an anonymous donor. And um, uh, next slide, please. This will launch uh, Indigenous Peoples Day with a Facebook premiere of videos that will be available on the website of Professor Sh Sherry Thomas, a professor of Lila librarianship in Calais Pueblo, uh, doing workshops on treaties, um, historical context of the treaties, and research that you can do with the IDA Treaties Explorer. Um, so I, I hope you'll you'll dip into those videos and enjoy them. And uh, thank you very much. We look forward to to continuing to hear about your collaborations. Hi, everybody. Thank you to the American Philosophical Society for supporting my work and providing me with the opportunity to share our work here at the Pueblo of Isleta with all of you today. And many thanks to so many of you for such wonderful presentations this week as well. I've been loving seeing and learning from so many friends and other folks doing really amazing work in Indigenous archives and communities all over. Um, as Brian mentioned, I am the archivist for the Pueblo of Isleta Department of Cultural and Historic Preservation and Yonanan Cultural Center. The Yonanan Cultural Center opened earlier this year, and I've brought in a few images today to show you what it looks like. Adriana, um, I don't have any specific cues necessarily for progressing through the slides, so if you would just like to periodically just advance to the next one, that'd be great. Um, the center is located in the newly renovated Pueblo of Isleta Day School building. It is uh, 13,926 square feet in size and houses the Department of Cultural and Historic Preservation offices and the community archive that includes 12,000 square feet of secure climate controlled storage and workspace classroom and library spaces, an exhibition gallery, and a lecture hall. We are in the very beginning stages of our work here, um, thanks to COVID-related delays. And in fact, I am still awaiting shelving and flat files. Uh, I'm still awaiting an office computer, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, the Southern Tiwa Pueblo of Islata is a community with a resident population of just over 3,000 and an additional 1,700 tribal members live outside of the reservation. Isleta is located 13 miles south of the Albuquerque and has lived where it is now for at least 1,000 years. Isleta is regarded both culturally and archeologically as a longtime cultural and economic center in the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary Southern Tiwa landscape. The Tiwa people have stewarded these lands for generations and continue to play a vital role in its protection, restoration, and prosperity. The Southern Tiwa ancestral homeland is marked and defined by many locations, each possessing multiple stories and each telling in turn a part of Isleta's living history. Isleta's people are surrounded by these stories and places and the old village, very much still in use, and inhabited remains the center of the Isleta world and homeland. However, being adjacent to a major urban center um, has quickened the pace of cultural knowledge loss here and has negatively impacted the intergenerational transmission of cultural practices necessary to their continuation. In the past, traditions were taught and maintained by families in traditional societies through winter songs and storytelling and in everyday life. Isleta's Southern Tiwa village is still, or language, excuse me, is still spoken by a majority of community members over the age of 50 and is understood by some younger adults in the Pueblo, but is no longer being spoken by the youngest community members. 
The DCHP is staffed by Director Daniel Wasita, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, Dr. Henry Walt, Administrative Assistant Nadine Wakanda, and with the inauguration of Yonan An, the Pueblo of Isleta has expanded the DCHP staff to include a permanent full-time archivist position, which is filled by me. Um, my responsibilities here include the organization, digitization, and preservation of the Pueblo's collection of archival materials and the creation of a living community archive in collaboration with community members, other DCHP staff, and institutional partners. Um, my own relationship with the DCHP began about three and a half years ago as I was conducting my dissertation research. My dissertation focuses upon the ancestral Pueblo site of Pottery Mound. Pottery Mound was excavated in the 50s and 60s and again in the late 70s by the University of New Mexico. And in 2012, the university deeded the site to the Pueblo of Isleta. Since then, the DCHP has been involved in significant non-invasive archaeological work and preservation and stabilization efforts at the site. The DCHP has officially been in existence since that time, but has been active since 96. Um, over the last 20 plus years, the DCHP has acquired numerous culturally and historically significant archival documents, oral histories, photographs, ceramics, and other materials through land claims research, archaeological projects, contributions by interested community members, and in interinstitutional cooperation. And these are the materials that make up our current collection. Um, our first major undertaking at the center is a multi-tiered project called Telling History from the Land. It is a project that will catalog the Pueblo's collection of archival materials in a way that both reflects and demonstrates key cultural concepts such as relationality, land-based knowledge systems, and community responsibility. We plan to use Mukutu collections management system as our digital platform and we will work in collaboration with an advisory council of tribal elders to define appropriate cultural protocols. A super important component both of this particular project and our work here at the center broadly includes the digitization and incorporation of collections of culturally significant materials that are currently housed in other museums, libraries, and archives, many of which remain currently unseen and unknown by most community members. Conversations currently underway include a heritage seed project in collaboration with the University of Michigan Anthropological or Museum of Anthropological Archaeology, formal tribal collections review processes of pottery mound materials at the Maxwell Museum of Anthropology, Pueblo of Isleta materials at the Indian Arts Research Center in Santa Fe, and Pueblo of Isleta materials at the Field Museum in Chicago. Other institutions we've worked with in the past whose collections we hope to incorporate into our digital collection and make available to his Isleta community members as well, include, of course, the American Philosophical Society, the University of California, Irvine, the Department of Anthropology Collection at the National Museum of Nat Natural History, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Archives of Traditional Music at Indiana University. Thank you all so much for your time. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for the APS for putting this together. Um, thank you for everyone presenting. It's been really great to listen to all the presentations. Uh, my name is Noel Smith, um, and I've uh, been working on a few different projects uh, with the Nachi Nation over the past 10 years or so. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, just as I, I like to start um, from the Nachi original ancestral homelands. I forgot to mention I'm presenting from the ancestral homelands of the Amamutsin as well to make a connection there. But the Nachi are originally from uh, modern day Natchez, Mississippi. It's a town that's named after them. In 1731, they were attacked by the French and driven from their lands and today live in Oklahoma and South Carolina. Next slide, please. And really all over the Southeast, um, but mostly in South Carolina and Oklahoma. Now, in 2010, um, I was, uh, or go back one, back to that map. Um, in 2010, I, I uh, was starting my uh, dissertation. Oh, I, I you skipped over. There we go. Perfect. Thank you, Adriana. 
Um, I, in 2010, I began working on my dissertation project um, and I reached out to the Nachi Nation. I was, I'm living in California, uh, but I went out and introduced myself to the Nachi Council. Um, and I began a, a process in which I got to know them and I really wanted to do a historical project um, that both brought in their knowledge and insight, but also that would be meaningful to them um, and their communities. And in particular, the Nachi um, are not federally recognized. So uh, I started out doing a lot of research um, uh, with uh, trying to just, I, what I wanted to do was to aid the, the recognition process, to, to, to give um, the Nazi communities more written evidence from colonial archives um, that would support the stories that they knew, that they had been um, to all these different places, lived with various Native American groups, um, and, and how they end up in Oklahoma and South Carolina. Next slide, please. So the Nachi Kuso, um, I teach in the uh, teach 18th century history, and I'm often teaching about hundreds of years ago. Um, so this is a pretty uh, a basic point, I think, to a lot of you in this audience. But the Nachi are still around. There's the Nachi Kuso of the Disto River, a thriving community in South Carolina. And then next slide, please. There's also the Nachi Nation of Oklahoma. Um, that's Hudkey Fields, the great son of the Nachi. Um, he's my closest contact um, and someone who knows more about Nachi history and culture than anyone I've ever met. Every time I go to Oklahoma, it goes really quick because uh, we nerd out on, on Nachi history and it's been uh, really fun to just talk to him about. Um, anytime I have a question, he, he knows the, the answer. Um, so it's fun to, fun to chat with him. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Um, I tried to make the beginning part a little quicker when I was practicing this morning. It took me forever to get to the language material stuff. So while I was doing my historical research for the dissertation, I uh, came across a lot of language materials at the APS um, and some at the Smithsonian as well. And some of Swanton's notes are at the APS as well. But Mary Haas's collection, some of you out there are probably working with some of Mary Haas's notes was particularly uh, uh, important and rich for Nazi linguistic history. There's a lot of really interesting uh, stuff in there. Um, John Swanton um, took poor notes and took a lot of liberty in his translation. Mary Haas seemed to be much more carefully focused on trying to um, document the language as she understood it. Um, what's really kind of cool about Mary Haas is she also interviewed not just um, uh, Nazi men like Watt Sam, who is a really important contact, but also a Nazi woman named Nancy Raven. And so there's some stories from uh, Nazi women from 1930s, well, one, uh, Nancy Raven, and uh, she tells stories that men wouldn't tell. And so there's the, some really kind of rich um, um, stories in the collection itself. Uh, there's a lot of language materials as well at the APS. Um, Mary Haas wrote a lot of lexicons and grammatical lists and that sort of thing. Um, next slide, please. So this is just an example of some of the work we're doing. Um, she took her field notes are on the left and then she typed up a lot of the stories and wrote them in Nachi and then translated it word for word. Um, but they're not in complete paragraphs, so uh, Hutke and I are working on uh, translating these and to put them into rough um, paragraphs so that some of these stories can be understood in English as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, working with the, the Nachi is incredibly important. Um, this is something that Brian at the APS and the APS have reached out to Hutke as well, and I think that commitment to really kind of putting community interests first is something that's really important. Of course, it gets, um, you know, complicated when lots of uh, views in the communities are different, but uh, that's one of just another reason why it's important for me and, and others to work with Native American peoples, particularly when you're not Native like myself. There's sacred knowledge in the archives and the, the, the communities themselves should have control of this. Uh, next slide, please. And then just a final uh, kind of couple points here. Um, ultimately, in the next few decades, uh, I think Hutke and I both dream of a day when Nazi people are speaking Nazi um, again, and that also other people can study the Nazi language. Um, this is the beginning of a big project. We look to other language reclamation projects for inspiration. Um, we're thinking of language textbooks or some sort of online materials and children's books, um, particularly teaching children as, as an avenue to get the language uh, coming back. 
And ultimately, the goal of my research and my work with the Nachi is uh, I can go to all the archives I go to, I take pictures, I put it to Dropbox, I share with the Nachi, they have access. And so uh, in addition to kind of doing the work for my own scholarly work, I'm always trying to collect archives and then share them to, to begin creating, uh, not, not to begin, to, to add to the existing um, kind of archival collection that's been informally put together by the Nachi over the last few decades. All right, thank you. Thank you everyone for your presentations. Uh, I see there's many uh, connections across all of these projects, uh, many similarities and uh, many unique characteristics as well. Um, I'd encourage our participants who are attending, um, please feel free to uh, put any questions you would have for the group as a whole or to individual people in the Q&A window. Um, I'll begin with a, just a general question that could be answered by anybody or all of you. Um, I think we see a common, th a th common theme in all of these uh, projects is that they are based on um, longstanding um, goals that many communities have had in using archival materials in creating new resources and so forth. Um, so they're grounded, they're not just things that you thought up out on your own, they're grounded in existing needs and goals. Um, but as we all know, there's also, uh, with every new year, there's, there are new digital tools, new technologies, new non-digital things. So could you talk about, um, uh, and there's often a need in developing a project into um, thinking of what the goal that the community has and how to manifest it, how to achieve it in a particular form. Could you talk about any experiences you've had in involving the community and how to develop this sort of concrete manifestation of how these goals uh, will be achieved. Um, and uh, I would encourage anyone uh, who would like to jump in to go ahead and also to please feel free to uh, change the question or ask your other uh, presenters any questions that come to mind. Anna, please go ahead, sure. Um, I can speak a little bit to what we did, um, and uh, you know, um, we we have a lot of stuff going on right now, um, uh, and partnerships and grants and that kind of thing. But but the way that we began was really bootstrapping. Um, you know, we started out we started out you know at feast days talking with people about the kinds of research that they wanted to do, um, and looking to see what was available and looking to see what the barriers were. Um, and when we started developing the online digital archive project, we really started uh, super bootstrappy. You know, we got a couple of, a couple of documents um, and started just sharing those online and sharing those links around just to kind of show the potential. You know, we got a list of student names from one of the boarding schools and, you know, that just, that just hadn't been available for, for people to research their family histories and that kind of thing before. So, I just want to encourage anybody who's thinking about a project, you know, there, those, um, you know, small, uh, rough, uh, rough and ready kind of uh, steps that you can take at first, those are really worth doing. They're really worth doing to have the conversations and, and start, start talking more about what can happen. Hi, Brian. Uh, this is Patrick again. Like Dr. Naruto Maya, um, this project really was snowballed from a lot of on the ground conversations happening with community members. Um, a lot of these conversations really came from entering into community, particularly through community council meetings. Uh, community council members then disseminated information on what we were hopefully going to construct in the digital archive. But from those conversations, there were a number of different people's elders, cultural knowledge holders that approached myself and our director of our Tribal Historic Preservation Office to be a part of the type of interviewing that we were hoping to do, um, that we, we did and is still ongoing actually. So I think those conversations really benefited the integrity of our archive in that we had people from our four communities, Washington communities that were contributing. 
this makes for a more holistic um, kind of uh, construction of our archive. Uh, Memo, I saw your hand. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, for Hillary and for, for me, uh, we have been working in Oaxaca and especially in Mitla for the last 10 years. Uh, we've been aware that this town and especially Zapotec people, it's uh, there, um, there are people that always care about arts. There's a lot of art, uh, painters, poets, sculptors. So for us, it was very important to understand how people share themselves, like uh, these uh, artistic and cultural um, uh, manifestations, right? So for a moment, we thought to, to get involved with official institutions and then Mexican official institutions, uh, such as the state cultural uh, secretariat or something like that. But we decided that it was better to, to talk with people and to see uh, how they actually go and see their own uh, products, right? So that's why we decided to get involved with, uh, with Marco, who is he's also here, uh, who, who, who holds a, uh, this gallery in, in the middle of the town where all people gather and see their own manifestations. So I think that uh, getting involved on how people actually talk about their own cultural uh, products, it's, it's very important for us. Thank you. Does anyone else have any uh, thoughts on that particular? I'm also glad to. Con oh, but Brandon, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to uh, say, uh, working, uh, being an employee of a First Nations community, um, everything does pertain to the nation, but there still is this problem of. Um, making sure that the community itself engages with what the administration and what the research department's doing. So um, we develop newsletters and in time before coronavirus, we had uh, meetings and promoted those through various uh, streams of communication. And in doing so, we wanna bring the uh, community members in touch with the um, archive and research and, and environment department and not, not be isolated here in the office or in the archives. Um, I have something I can add as well, um, as I think just about everybody who has worked in any kind of community context, tribal or otherwise, understands um, there is very rarely consensus regarding um, all sorts of projects, <laughs> uh, particularly projects that are focusing upon the sharing of uh, culturally significant materials um, some of which can be quite sensitive and has uh, differing levels of access and restrictions and so forth. Um, so one of the ways I have thought about beginning our work here at the archive and particularly beginning the sort of public and community facing um, digital platform on Mukutu is that the first big project I plan to post up there is a collection of more than 2,000 photographs that were taken in the late 19th century um, here at the Pueblo of Isleta and um, inviting uh, community contributions uh, regarding those photographs, um, who the people are, possibly if this particular um, room block is still recognizable, um, you know, various uh, clothing and textile patterns and, and so forth. Um, and my reason for wanting to begin with this project in particular is that there's a great deal of community interest in these photographs. Um, these photographs were collected as part of the land claims research uh, done in the 90s and early 2000s. And um, a very small selection of these photographs were then assembled into what became a traveling exhibition that just returned home to the Pueblo about a year and a half ago. And um, community members have been able to see this exhibition at a gallery space located at the um, casino and resort here on the reservation. Um, so there's already a great deal of existing community interest. I am hopeful that that will translate into a great deal of community engagement not only with that project, but with the other projects that we launch here at the center as well. And I hope that it will help to make um, community members and particularly some of the, I think rightly, um, kind of wary and hesitant uh, tribal council members and uh, community knowledge holders 
um, help to make them familiar with the Mukatu platform and the differing levels of uh, security that, that it makes available um, on the basis of cultural protocols that they will essentially be the ones to, um, to outline and designate who has access to what. Thank you. Uh, Audra, yeah. Ned, did you? Yeah, yeah I'm, so I'm, I'm facilitating our, our Q&A feature. So if you have questions, please put them in, into that uh, option on your Zoom webinar. Uh, there's a question uh, specifically for Patrick uh, asking if you could explain the WashU research permit uh, that you mentioned. Who can get it and how is that done? Can you give us a little bit more information on that process? Sure, um, that's a great question. The Washoe Research Permit is administered by the Washoe Cultural Resources Advisory Committee that's made up of elders and cultural knowledge holders, all enrolled members of the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. Uh, this actual committee is kind of overseen by the TIPO, who is Daryl Cruz, also an enrolled member of the Washoe Tribe of Nevada and California. But it's the process of gaining an actual research permit is more complicated than just doing the actual paperwork for the permit. You're required to sit down with the WICRAC, that's the Washoe Cultural Resources Advisory Committee, and explain to them what the purpose of your work is, but also more importantly, how this work is contributing to the goals and the needs of the Washoe tribe. Um, I'm unaware of how these processes have continued or not because of COVID, but um, I'm positive that you can get clarification from the Washoe Tipo, who is Daryl Cruz. Uh, you can also contact me. I'm, I'm in close conver conversation with Daryl uh, almost uh, daily, so feel free to contact me as well. I can put my uh, email in the uh, chat. Great, perfect. Uh, we have a question uh, to Memo, Hillary, and Marco. Um, did, did Elsie Clues Parson also document locations that are still sacred to the local people today? And if so, uh, how will these be represented on the online uh, resources and will they be open to the public? Um, yeah, well, this is why the involvement with the community is important, but um, basically, uh, yeah, there, there's still a lot of places that have been sacred for Zapotec people uh, that Elsie Close uh, Parsons documented like 100 years ago that are still there. Um, there's like places that, uh, the, the, well, it's called the Devil's Cave, stuff like that. The, the, the archaeological site itself, uh, but other, other more. Uh, the first part of our project will be just translate the first impression that uh, the, that Parsons had, right? And to in order that the people in Midland understood how she she saw their their places, but also it's a, a another part of a project to collect stories and and histories of how people in Mitla still are looking for this and are yeah how they feel with these places how they uh, if they if it's still some meaningful to to them right and as well if they don't want to share this particular place we won't we will understand it or maybe they will tell us other places that they want to be incorporated in this map so yeah it's it's a constant dialogue with uh with our uh, colleagues there in middle and yeah the, the 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 goal is that everything is going to be shared in the in the cultural center pitao uh, beselao Wonderful. Uh, there's a question here that's actually for Brian, I think, um, and that's, uh, could developing an app uh, fall under the category of, of DKS or digital knowledge sharing? I don't know, Brian, do you, do you want to speak to that for a minute? I'll just very briefly, because um, I want to get, you know, give a space to our presenters, of course, but uh, uh, potential, the answer, short answer is potentially. Um, we have funded a project that is about some projects that are about technology development. Uh, usually there is some element of archival, working with archival materials. It doesn't have to be exclusively the case, but uh, as we get up the next round of applications for the next round of fellowships, we'd be glad to field any questions. So please feel free to be in touch with, uh, with me about uh, any questions in developing a project. Um, 
I would like to wonder, I was wondering if uh, we also do want to encourage a conversation. If anyone among our presenters has questions about another project, I will also want to sort of uh, feel free to uh, give you an opportunity to ask a cross question if something, if anything comes to mind for anybody. No pressure though. <laughs> Well, I, I'm, I'm so excited by, by all the things I've seen today, and I have a, a million questions. And um, one, one that I, I wanted to ask you, uh, Cassandra, um, I was so excited to see that your archives facility uh, is going in a historic, um, a historic building in your Pueblo, the historic day school building. And I know um, not everyone has, has kept these buildings. And I was wondering if you are able to speak a little bit to the, the process your community went through about that. Sure, um, I can only speak very briefly about that process, however, because I was not, I was not engaged in the decision-making that occurred around uh, choosing to house the cultural center here. Um, I do know that there were extensive conversations that occurred uh, within the DCHP and particularly in conjunction with Tribal Council, uh, which is an elected group. Uh, people on the council serve two-year terms. And so I believe there were a couple of different um, incarnations of the council who were engaged in this decision-making process. And of course, um, tribal elders and, and cultural authorities were involved in this process as well. Um, an architect, there was a, a bid put out or a call put out for architects to submit um, their ideas once this decision was made to house the center in this building. And um, the successful, the architect who was chosen, I'm sorry, I don't remember her name off the top of my head. Um, I will try and post that somewhere where everybody can see it later. Uh, but she did incorporate um, the existing architecture, I think, beautifully. Um, the room I'm sitting in right now, the entire ceiling is uh, the original wooden slats and vigas of the school. Um, in one of the rooms, you can actually see where one of the students must have carved their initials into one of the vigas. Um, but it's, it's a really, really um, interesting and wonderful place to be doing this work. And in fact, um, I just sent a uh, introductory letter out for the uh, monthly Pueblo newsletter. Um, introducing myself and the work that we're doing here and invited any community members who uh, attended school here and are interested in chatting with me about their memories of being a student at this school. Um, right now, just to get in touch with me either over the phone or by email, but ideally, once it's safe to do so, um, come in and have those conversations. And I foresee a, a future project that is actually focusing on this building itself. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask uh, one more question. Um, this is from uh, Jorge Rios and um, it's a question for Marco. Uh, Marco, este uh, pregunta de Jorge Rios es uh, uh, quiero conocer uh, de Marco uh, sus impresiones preliminares sobre el proyecto uh, este proyecto de uh, El Ciclus Parsons. En español es bueno, sí. Si. Pues para, tanto para el espacio como para la comunidad de Mitla, es importante porque nos va a permitir conocer parte de la historia el, de nuestros antepasados, la cultura y sobre todo el el resguardo de los archivos y el compartirlo con la misma comunidad, creo que será importante para, incluso para la historia de Oaxaca. Muchas gracias. And, uh, Adriana, did you, should we try one more question or should we? up there or? Well, we might have time for one more. Yeah. 
time for one more quick question. Sure. So this is there's a very good question in the Q and A from Elizabeth Caesar, and this could go to anybody as well. Um, and she says uh, the archives that the speakers have worked with all seem to be very open to materials being reproduced for placement in other repositories and communities. Um, is this just a feature of this fellows program or um, is it more common than you realized? What have been your experiences in uh, working with different repositories and their policies for um, allowing materials in other institutions? Well, it's kind of new, right? I mean, this is, this is sort of a new way of looking at things where sharing information and sharing copies of objects doesn't diminish anyone, but, but makes everyone stronger, um, you know, increases the history about the object, it increases the people's ability to use it. Um, it definitely hasn't always been this way. Uh, you know, repositories used to be kind of rewarded for exclusivity in a way, you know, they had the only whatever, or you could only come to them to see such and such. And I think there's a real shift now. Um, there's still a lot of uh, institutional prohibitions on things uh, in many places. Um, you know, and some of that is legacy, some of some of that can, some of that will change for some institutions, some of that may never change for other institutions. But I think there's definitely an opening um, a, a willingness to share, a, um, an eagerness to um, be part of digital preservation, digital repatriation, even if they don't have the staff to outreach to people about what they have. Um, I think it's always worth talking to talking to institutions. This memo, please go ahead. Yeah, for us, it has been like an amazing opportunity to uh, to have access on, of, to some archives because um, it's not that they were not like easy or difficult to access, but it, they were just far away from the place that the information was taken out, right? From, I mean, Midland is not just outside uh, Philadelphia, it's outside the United States, right? So that information um, was, I think it was first in Chicago, then traveled to to Philadelphia, but now it's possible to make this connection easily. So uh, I think this is a great opportunity that has to be more explored through these types of projects. Uh, Noel, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but yeah, I'd love to hear any experience you have. Great. <laughs> um, so uh, for me, I mean, to collaborate effectively with the Nachi, I need to share the materials I'm looking at so they can look at them as well. Um, so, I mean, so that's what I think of it as. Um, and also, um, the other thing that I was thinking about is just, uh, yeah, I mean, to me, it's just part of the process um, of, of sharing. And, and right now it's very informal, so they're not reproducing it or, so I, you know, the legal things haven't really been an, an issue so far. Um, but also just that idea of, 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 of access um, that was just mentioned, like being able to get to the archive itself is something that a lot of people in Oklahoma who are struggling just to survive can't do. So if I can go there with a research grant and look at some archives and then share that with people back in Oklahoma, then that's just something that I can do as a researcher to try to bridge those, those gaps of knowledge and access to knowledge in, in archives. Great, anybody else? All right, well, I think we are uh, at the end of this session. So I want to uh, again, thank our presenters uh, for sharing their work with us. It's really lovely to see you all again um, and to hopefully see some of you here in Philadelphia uh, before long when it's safe to do so. Um, I invite all of you who are still with us to join us again in about uh, 50 minutes for our uh, final session. Um, in which uh, Brian and I will be in conversation with more of our uh, Native American Scholars Initiative um, fellows to talk about the needs, opportunities, and future directions in that field. So uh, I hope you'll join us at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, until then, uh, please join me in again thanking our speakers for this really wonderful session. <laughs>